Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Let me just share my screen. Uh, so at the outset, uh, let me thank, is it visible? My screen is visible? Yes, Okay. Thank you. At the outlet, uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, Hormone India, Team Hormone India, a group of uh, young, enthusiastic endocrinologists, uh, for inviting me, and all the very best to you for your endeavors in the future as well. So, my topic for today is copeptin and the diagnosis of uh, DI, and uh, I have a small disclaimer to start off with, which is basically that uh, this is not. I do not have much experience with copeptin. I have not uh, uh, done this assay ever. So this is going to be essentially a, a more than a pragmatic discussion. It's going to be a concept-based discussion. So let's look at it in the next 20 minutes. Uh, what are the ways in which copeptin can help us uh, diagnose in the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus? Oh. Yes. Um, so you can see that uh, this is just a brief uh, overview of what happens uh, in the uh, hypothalamic posterior pituitary axis. So you can see that the hypothalamic uh, neurons are here which uh, synthesize and secrete ADP, and then it is transported down to posterior pituitary, stored here, and released uh, when the appropriate uh, stimulus is applied, which usually responds to both osmotic and uh, volume uh, reduction in volume and reduction in pressure. So these are the stimuli which uh, uh, induce a synthesis of ADP secretion. And uh, you can also see that ADP has a small role to play in the anterior pituitary as well, where it uh, regulates the um, increase in ACTH in response to stress along with the CRH. So this is a very brief overview of what AVP does. So what happens once the AVP is released from the pituitary, where does it act? The predominant action that we are concerned uh, with regards to today's discussion is basically in the renal collecting duct where it acts on the V2 receptor here. And by virtue of its action, it uh, increases expression of a channel called the aquaporin channel. These are water channels. So this leads to reabsorption of water back into the system, and then, uh, hence it prevents loss of water and causes diuresis, uh, prevents diuresis. So what are the uh, pathologies in which this particular hormone is uh, has an imbalance? One is, of course, there is a deficiency in the hormone, which is called central diabetes insipidus, where ADH is not being secreted from the posterior pituitary or from the hypothalamus. The second one is if there is a problem with the action of the ADH. So if there is resistance to uh, ADH action, and the kidneys don't respond to ADH in an appropriate manner, and that will also lead to uh, same clinical features, which the patient will present with polyuria and polydipsia. We also have a third differential diagnosis uh, to patients who are present with polyuria and polydipsia, and that is what is called as um, primary polydipsia, which can either mean a dipsogenic diabetes insipidus or a psychogenic diabetes insipidus. So this is also very important for us to differentiate from central DI because what happens is in central DI, all you have to do is replace the hormone and everything will be okay. In nephrogenic DI, if you replace the hormone, it's not going to work. And in primary polydipsia, you should not be replacing the hormone. You should be cutting down on the fluid intake because that is where the issue is. So it's important for us to uh, start clearly differentiate between these etiologies before we decide on a therapeutic plan. So if we have to differentiate, common sense tells us that all we have to do is look at the vasopressin levels and then look at, uh, give some vasopressin and see the response. So if you have this combination, it should be pretty easy for us to differentiate. So in central DI, you expect the vasopressin to be low, but you expect the patient to respond very well to exogenously given uh, given uh, medication. And however, in nephrogenic DI, the vasopressin basal level itself will be high. And if you give any exogenous desmopressin or vasopressin, it's not going to have any response. Um, on the other hand, in, dip, uh, in dipsogenic DI, you will see that the vasopressin, vasopressin levels are low and the patient also does not respond to exogenous vasopressin adequately. So this should be pretty easy for us to differentiate between the three forms of DI. However, um, clinically uh, or practically, we do not do this simply because we do not have vasopressin assays. Reliable vasopressin assays are not there. And why do we not have reliable vasopressin assays? Because this molecule is a fairly unique molecule. One is it has a very short half-life, which is uh, roughly around 24 minutes. So if your uh, sampling is delayed by 30 minutes, you can have varying values. The second, of course, like many other hormones, it is secreted in a pulsatile manner in response to stimuli. So you may not always be catching it at the right time. Last, uh, Another uh, feature is that it's a small peptide. It has only nine amino acids. So this makes it difficult for us to develop epitopes to create 
good robust antibody based assays and lastly it also has undergoes very rapid in vitro degradation so after the sample is collected ex vivo in uh, in vivo also actually this is degraded very fast which is why it has a very short half life but even ex vivo the protein undergoes significant degradation um, so this makes it a very unstable compound and then uh, it becomes difficult to store or sample collect the sample appropriately so commercial assays that are available today are not very reliable only in research settings you have reliable assays for avp which can detect the accurate avp value so we do have a challenge with uh, checking the vasopressin so what have we been doing all these years we have been using the water deprivation test in order to differentiate between various forms of di so here you can see very clearly that if you look at the red line you can see this is a no how a normal person will respond to water deprivation or withholding any form of fluid so your uh, urine osmolality will rise it will reach uh, a peak and after that even if you give desmopressin which is a synthetic vasopressin you will see that the urine osmolality cannot further rise because the patient has reached his maximum uh, concentrating ability if you look at the last little uh, green line here that actually refers to complete nephrogenic di so you can see that even when you deprive the patient of water the urine osmolality is not rising even when you give desmopressin is not rising so this is very clear desmopressin is there but it's not acting so this is nephrogenic di there's another one here which is a light blue arrow which is the patient does not respond to so uh, water deprivation at all the urine osmolality continues to remain low but the minute you administer desmopressin you can see that there is a nice response so these three uh, two extremes which is complete Uh, central di and complete nephrogenic di are very easy for us to differentiate uh, however we know that in clinical practice very often patients fall into the partial or the milder variants so you can have a partial nephrogenic di or you can have a mild form of central di and this along with the primary polydipsia you can see that all of them kind of overlap heavily so this makes diagnosis very very difficult for us and if you do not diagnose it correctly our therapy is not going to be appropriate so these are the three variants that we need to fine tune or improve our diagnostic accuracy which is uh, partial central di partial nephrogenic di primary polydipsia so that is how now oh, this is brief, uh, just quickly about how to interpret it so if there is more than 50% increase it's clearly central di less than 10% it's clearly ndi however often we will see values between 10 to 50% which is uh, equivocal so in order to bridge the gap that is how this molecule has come in fact uh, vasopressin was the first molecule that was attempted but after many many years of failed attempts to build a robust uh, vasopressin assay uh, people started looking at copeptin so what exactly is copeptin so as you can see here copeptin is basically a part of the precursor molecule of vasopressin so this is a pre pro vasopressin and copeptin is part of it this is what is there in the hypothalamus and as it is uh, transported down via the axons and reaches the posterior uh, pituitary it is broken down into vasopressin neurophysin and copeptin and all three of them are stored in the secretory granules there and when uh, there is a stimulus and there is a response to stimulus during exocytosis these uh, both vasopressin and copeptin are secreted in equimolar concentrations into the circulation so then people started thinking okay vasopressin and copeptin are coming out from the same place in response to the same stimuli so can we use this as a surrogate marker of copeptin uh, vasopressin so we'll just look at how it compares with vasopressin so when you look at the half life it has a longer half life clearly um because it is a glycosylated peptide and that increases its half life it is co secreted in equimolar concentrations like i mentioned earlier it has 39 amino acids making uh, giving us more epitopes in order to create a more robust antibody based assay and it is uh, best of all it is stable ex vivo or in vitro and does not undergo rapid degradation like vasopressin so even though vasopressin uh, we could not create successful commercial assays copeptin on the other hand uh, is coming up as an ideal surrogate marker for av so briefly we will look at whatever uh, we have uh, data we have on copeptin these are early studies which looked at stability of copeptin and you can see that even at room temperature this molecule is stable for 7 days as hardly any uh, decrease in the levels even at the end of 7 days at the end of 14 days of course you see that there is a subtle reduction in room temperature 
But if you're storing it at four degrees centigrade, even at uh, two weeks, there is hardly any reduction. So this is a very stable compound, which can be stored in assay at a later date. So uh, some basic data, men's tend to have slightly higher uh, value than women, but otherwise they both respond to the in the same fashion to uh, hyperosmolar stimuli. And of course, uh, common sense tells you that if there is a water or a liquid meal, there will be a reduction in the AVP. But otherwise, nutrient waste, there is no change in AVP secretion. I'm sorry, copeptin secretion. So whether you you can take it irrespective, there's no circadian rhythm either. So you can collect it at any time of the day and irrespective of whether you've had a meal or not. However, it's important to remember water or any liquid diet can uh, cause a acute fall in the um, levels of uh, copeptin. This is uh, exercise. So you can, uh, as logically, we would expect uh, copeptin levels and AVP levels to go up after exercise. So that is what you're seeing here. Another condition where AVP and um, copeptin is significantly elevated is patients with sepsis. So we again know that AVP uh, secretion, I mean, secretion of AVP stimulates CRH. So AVP and copeptin are also surrogate markers of stress. They can also be called stress hormones. In fact, uh, correlation uh, with stress-related conditions is better for copeptin when compared to cortisol. And cortisol is the common stress hormone that all of us are familiar with. So any stressful condition also tends to increase your copeptin uh, secretion. This uh, graph shows you the uh, correlation value between ADP and copeptin. And you can see whether it's a normal controls or in patients with sepsis, the correlation is pretty good. In fact, the R value is 0.78. Again, here it depends on what assay you have used. So uh, remember we said commercially available ADP assays are not very robust and they're not very good. So when they uh, tested ADP against copeptin with using commercially available assays, the correlation coefficient was only about 0.3. However, when they uh, looked, uh, checked it with um, research-based robust assays for AVP, the correlation coefficient was 0.8. So there is a real problem with AVP assay and copeptin seems to have uh, helped us overcome that issue. So we will look at a very simplified algorithm. This is how to use copeptin in our patients who present to us with polyuria, polydipsia. So the first thing you can do is a baseline copeptin. Because initially, you have to be sure that the patient does have polyuria, polydipsia. You should also rule out hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, etc. So once you have done that, you can go ahead and do a random copeptin level, even without any fluid uh, deprivation. And if it is elevated, we don't really have to concentrate on the numbers if, necessary, if required now. Because you know, if you're doing the test, you can always refer to it. So if it is clearly elevated, which is about 21.4, then there is no doubt this patient has nephrogenic PI. However, if it is suppressed, and if you have not done any fluid deprivation, we don't have a value for low copeptin. But if the patient has undergone some fluid deprivation, let's say for about 5 hours or 8 hours, and your basal copeptin is less than 2.6, you can also say with some amount of certainty that this is uh, central DI. Now, often when the values fall, less than 21 or between these two, what is the next step that we should do? So there we have to do something called stimulated copeptin. How do you stimulate copeptin? What is the greatest stimulus to release AVP from the posterior pituitary? You have to increase the serum osmolality. And what we do to measure serum osmolality? So a, a reliable marker is a plasma sodium level. So you can infuse hypertonic saline, reach a plasma sodium of 147 at least, and then check your uh, copeptin level. This is what is called the stimulated copeptin level. So again, we have cutoffs of 4.9. So if it is more than 4.9, then you're dealing with primary polydipsia. Whereas if it's less than 4.9, you're dealing with central DI. So this is a very useful algorithm if we have access to copeptin assays. So again, this is um, utility of copeptin in various clinical scenarios. So in polyuria polydipsia, we can start off, like I mentioned earlier, with random copeptin measurement. Your interpretation can be stopped if, uh, or your testing can be stopped if your copeptin levels are very high and you're sure that this is nephrogenic DI. The diagnostic accuracy is excellent. You don't have to do any further testing. Anything less than uh, 221.4, you have to uh, uh, put the patient across to a stimulated copeptin. There are two ways of doing stimulated copeptin. One is the hypertonic saline infusion test that I mentioned. 
And more recently, there's an arginine infusion test that has also has been introduced for stimulation of copeptin. Again, arginine is something that's not available in India, so it's not practically very useful for us. However, the hypertension, uh, hypertonic saline infusion test, so you give 3% saline, uh, 250 ml bolus over 15 minutes, and then continue it with um, a steady um, um, 0.3% um, saline at the 3% saline at the rate of 0.15 ml per kg. And then you have to monitor sodium every 30 minutes. And once it crosses 147, you can draw a sample for copeptin. Again, we have discussed the cutoffs. The 4.9 is your cutoff. Anything higher than that is likely to be primary polydipsia. Of course, the arginine infusion test that I just mentioned, it's much more convenient than using hypertonic saline infusion test. Because uh, side effects are lesser, patients tolerate it better, we can use it in children. So many advantages over the arginine when compared to hypertonic uh, saline. However, the diagnostic accuracy is slightly lesser. But it's good enough, particularly if you want to use it first. And then if you need a confirmation, you can go for the hypertonic saline. Um, again, the cutoffs here are slightly different. Another place where you can utilize this copeptin is patients who are undergoing transphenoidal surgery. And you want to look at their risk of developing DI. So uh, the first test actually looked at insulin-induced hypoglycemia and stimulated copeptin along with that. And that had a 100% prediction to tell which patient will develop permanent DI following the transphenoidal surgery. Of course, uh, putting every patient post-TSS uh, to insulin-induced hypoglycemia is probably not a very practical thing to do. So uh, the, other, so the other test that people... Uh, did where to look use the surgery itself as a stress and see in the first post-operative day, uh, look at the copeptin values and see whether we can predict it. So again, here, if the first post-operative day, if your value is very high, uh, the cutoff here they got was 30, it gives you a good negative predictive value that this patient is less likely to develop uh, permanent DI. However, if the value is very less, uh, positive predictive value of this patient developing permanent DI is significantly high. Another place where we can utilize it is in patients, in hospitalized patients with hypernatremia. Often we are not sure what is causing it. Is it simple dehydration? Have we iatrogenically introduced it? Or does this patient also have DI? So if you look at data, data says that, you know, if the patient has DI, we have to also give desmopressin free water alone may, may be inadequate. So it's sometimes there is a significant delay in starting desmopressin simply because we are not sure about the etiology. So this is one place where copeptin will definitely help to decide whether there is, uh, along with the uh, whatever other reason that's going on in the hospitalized patients in the acute setting, is there coexistent DI as well. Even in hyponatremia, it's useful, but I'm not going to cover that. Just like we spoke about assay in AVP, even with copeptin, there are various assays. And so we should be slightly familiar with what assay we are using and is that really validated or not. So there are different immunoassays which are present and available today. The original one was an immunoluminometric assay, which is called LIA. And then there's another one, which is slightly better version, which is uh, um, an automated immunofluorescence successor of the same assay, which is on the Cryptor platform. There are many ELISA-based uh, immunoassays that have been developed to uh, measure copeptin. However, these are not truly validated in most of the studies that have been done to date. So it's important for us to dig in and find out if we are ordering a commercial copeptin assay. It's important for us to figure out what the methodology is. So here is a study uh, which looked at these three assays and tried to see how they performed. This is a patient group that we are interested in, which is polyuria polydipsia. And you can see that both Kryptor and LIA are showing you much lower values of copeptin uh, compared to the ELISA, which is giving you a much, much higher value. So there is a huge incongruence between the values obtained between these two platforms. So this is something that all of us should be alerted to. So the same patients uh, were divided into central DI and primary polydipsia based on the simulated and basal copeptin value. And you can see that based on the basal copeptin value, you can see, you know, it is 1.6 and 0.8. And here it is 18.2. And the stimulated copeptin value for central DI when it remained 1.7, 1.4, here it was 17.2. So you're going to miss a lot of your central DI patients and you're going to misclassify them as primary polydipsia if you're not sure about uh, which assay you're using. So it's important for us to look into it. 
The primary polydips here also had elevated. So what is uh, what seems to be happening here is that there is some false false elevation of ABP in these ELISA assays. So if you look at the diagnostic accuracy, you can see that the ELISA had only 55% diagnostic accuracy compared to 98% diagnostic accuracy for the uh, cryptor-based platform. So it's very, very important for us to be aware of this and to be cognizant of what test we are using uh, in our clinical practice. So that will be the end of my talk. So in conclusion, copeptin is emerging as a diagnostic test of uh, choice in DI. And recent reports have suggested that it can be utilized in many, many other clinical scenarios. Like I showed you sepsis, there are many other clinical scenarios also. Uh, it is likely to replace the cumbersome water deprivation test even in our country because eventually we will get good, reliable copeptin assays here. It's much more easier to do. It has better diagnostic accuracy, so it's a matter of time before we all migrate into it. But the caution that we need to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, always try to look into the details because commercial assays may be using ELISA platforms and the diagnostic cutoffs that you and I read in the books will not be applicable for those. So thank you very much.